My main thing was obviously to try and put my own stamp on something. Yeah, find my own path. I, w I wanted my own time to, to create, you know, and, and have that creative freedom. And I found it now with um, Chatter Bay, and I do have that. The next challenge is building my team so I can really c do the food that I'd like to do. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Restaurants with a view are sometimes tarnished with a perception that the food could be average as operators take advantage of the surroundings. But restaurants rarely survive unless all facets are running like a well-oiled machine. How do you deliver food that can match the views when the views are unbeatable? Calvin Katz is the head chef at Ripple's Chowder Bay. Calvin, how are you? Hey, I'm good, thanks, Huck. How are you going? Good. It's great to get you on the show. You're uh, working in a restaurant with arguably the best views in, in Sydney. Uh, what's it like there? Oh, thanks very much, Huck. Yeah, it's a beautiful spot. I uh, started with a Sydney restaurant group at Ripple's about four months ago. It's been, uh, it's been good. It's a, a bit of a challenge at the moment, um, considering staffing and, and mm, the, the, f the, food, the food, I've put my own sort of touch on the food at the moment. So, you know, it's not an overly big restaurant. We're still keeping the same business model. We do a lot of weddings. We do a lot of group bookings. Um, but main, mainly, um, we're, our, our deep focus is on, on seafood down there, being a waterfront restaurant. And we use a lot of you know, seasonal produce. Um, got a good relationship with a lot of my suppliers. And um, yeah. Well, what's it like for you as a chef in, in that environment? Is there pressures in regards to the direction that you take the food given um, such stunning sort of views and, you know, the lure that people have to come to the venue for those views? There is a very high expectation on that, on that restaurant considering the, the area and the demographic of, of the customers that we get down at Chatter Bay and Mossman. It is kind of a more of an upmarket sort of area of Sydney. So the expectations are high. So there is very little room for error, um, which is where, where it gets difficult, obviously. It's, it's about being smart with your menu to, to really buy and, and, know, and know your ingredients, what's available, what you can get at a you know, costly, costly price to be able to put it on the plate, make it look beautiful. You mentioned that seafood uh, is is really heroed there. What, what's something that we might expect on the menu, sort of at the moment with seafood that you're really loving? Yeah, um, look, I really like working with um, here in Kingfish from South Australia. It's it's a fantastic product. So we have a a great dish we've just put on now. It's a sort of a kingfish rosa, which is like a we roll it in a we lightly cure it with some citrus and salt, and we roll it like a rose, and sort of serves with a almost like a ponzu dressing. It's a lemon, soy, um, and yuzu, yuzu based gluten-free dressing. And we put basil, compressed apples, a bit of black caviar. That's, that's a great dish. It's sort of one of the star entree dishes at the moment. And we're using all the, so a few other, you know, well-known Australian ingredients like the Sydney Rock oysters from East 33. It's a fantastic, fantastic oyster. Um, we have a Cone Bay Barramundi, you know, John Dory Milanese, so a few few different uh, seafood options. And, of course, we have the fish and chips, which we can't take away because, you know, everyone loves their fish and chips. Well, what, what's your approach to cooking? Is, is there a dish or two that sort of exemplifies your approach to what you're doing there? Yeah. Look, my, my approach to cooking, I, I came from a sort of a, a background where everything was very artisanal. Um, so I do like to work with fresh pasta, um, yeah, using, using when, the, when we buy our seafood in, we like to buy all of our fish in whole and break it down on site rather than just getting the fillets in from the mungna and, and, um, you know, whacking it straight into a pan. I really enjoy working with the whole, the whole animal or the whole, the whole creature and looking at the autonomy, um, and teaching that as well to, to the other staff that I have working with me. Um, you know, passing that knowledge down. Are there advantages in sort of going for that sort of nose to tail ethos with the seafood and things that you can use across the kitchen? Uh, look, there's, for, for me, it's a, it, it actually comes down to a personal preference at the moment. It's, it's almost from a business point, it's nearly, it's nearly cheaper to, to buy your fish in filleted 
Um, it, yeah, at, the, at these point, of the, the, these times with these economic prices, yeah, it, it almost is cheaper to buy your fish in filleted. Um, but I do enjoy getting the fish in whole, looking at the whole, you know, even even with rabbits, you know, we're getting, we had a whole rabbit terrine on there with a line through the center, you know. Yeah, so deboning the whole rabbits and getting the whole chickens in rather than just buying sections of each animal, which which is, you know, nothing wrong with that as well. You know, I understand, but yeah, I think we enjoy doing it, doing everything from scratch, the artisanal, that's how I was sort of trained and, and I'm trying to continue that. It's just, yeah, hmm. Do you think there's a danger that that's sort of a lost art, given that those the parity with the price points there are sort of coming together? Yeah, definitely. It's a it's a combination of of everything where it's it's losing it. Um, like when I was an apprentice, there would have been. Um, I did my apprenticeship at Catalina Rose Bay, and um, there must have been about eight of us apprentices, all Australian as well, in the kitchen since my apprenticeship. I haven't seen another Australian apprentice my whole career. <laughs> so I don't know if we were the last ones left, or, but I haven't seen any of them. But that that was all given to me there. Um, you know, we would, you know, learn how to smoke salmon, fillet fish, debone chickens, make a sauce from scratch, you know, roll pasta. Whereas now the chefs that come into the industry, it's really tough trying to find um, one, passionate people, um, and then two people that have that sort of exposure and background, um, you know, when I first started this career, you know, checks and dockets in the kitchen were, they were, they were handwritten still. It was like three ply paper and there was a real old school, you know, they had those career waiters that were really professional and they'd, you know, you'd have to you'd decipher the docket from, <laughs> who, you know, which waiter was on, you know, he's got messy handwriting or, you know, that's, that's Mark or that's Pedro. That's Alan today writing that. So you and they all have their way of writing it, and yeah, transferring that all back into nowadays. The, a lot of the new chefs that I get, not not that it's uh, any of their fault. It's just probably you know the new technologies with cooking, like with everyone's using water baths and thermo mixes and stuff, which I love as well. It's great, but you know people people forget how to do everything without all this. They they're a bit lost in it all. Where. People don't cook as much on pans anymore. They don't. They don't make everything themselves. You know, they buy their bread in. They buy their fresh pasta from a supplier that makes fantastic pasta, and it's all ready to go these days. And you just have to put all the pieces together. Well, I want to explore sort of what you're doing there a little bit more later on. But take us back to when you were young. What, what sort of role did food play for you growing up? Um, look, food was always pretty big in my family. I come from a a Jewish family, so there's a lot of holidays throughout the year, and you know we're not a religious family, but we, you know, we keep the the few the few big holidays. And for me, they weren't ever really about religion. It was always about it was about the food, to be honest, because you know, mum and dad would always go shopping and buy just a copious amounts, and you know, there was always like it was always like a big feast. It was like Christmas every Friday night. You know what I mean? We'd have smoked salmon or roast dinner, different salads, different things growing up. You know, same in same in my grandparents' place. You know, they they are they are lived in Belvey Hill. I still remember the kitchen. It was an amazing kitchen with a big island in the middle. You know, ovens. So food's always been a big part of my life. I guess growing up. You know, we always used to go out to restaurants or eat at home. So it's yeah, it's always been around me. And I, I guess when I got into cooking, um, it wasn't. It wasn't I left school to go and become a chef. I think I left school very early and I I started in a, in a cake shop, um, yeah, Christopher's Cake Shop in near Mascot. So, they, yeah, it's a Greek cake shop, just making pies and, you know, little cakes and whatever. And it was a job for me, you know what I mean? My family were pissed off that I wasn't at school anymore. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was, you know, hanging out with the wrong crowd, starting to get into trouble and they're like, go get a job and... You know, they were the ones that hired me. You know, it's always hard, you know, finding a job when you have no experience and and you're, and you're very young. So I think I was 17 when I when I first started there. And, yeah, I just I just enjoyed it. Didn't really have a, a big passion for it at that stage. And it probably wasn't until later when I started working in restaurants and realized that, you know, how much of my childhood and my family probably – gave me that passion and creativity as well uh, around food um 
Yeah. You briefly mentioned Catalina Restaurant a little bit earlier on. Um, you you um, worked there a long time ago and now, early on in your career. What did you take from your time there? That was probably my um, most influential job. You know, I, I learned, you know, you know, how would you say, you know, when you learn, you never forget how to learn a um, – you never, you never forget, you know, uh, how to how to ride a bike. Once you ride a bike, you you can always ride a bike forever. I learn everything pretty much at Catalina. How to call a pass, how to shuck an oyster, how to fillet a fish. Um, you know, it was that real camaraderie there as well. There was a big team when I was there. Sometimes up to about 10, 12 chefs in the kitchen, and you know, all the yelling and the the screaming. I actually loved it. You know, it was chaotic every day. Big services. You know, we you know we bloody we push out the food from there it was a, it was a high hard kitchen um and it's still just as fantastic today i think they're, they're doing renovations now and um you know it's it's such a it was such a wonderful place to, to work and i still speak with everybody that i work with at catalina all those years ago we're still all in touch and you know some of some of them are still at catalina um and you know everyone else is sort of still in the food industry and off on their own path as you built your career, what's what's been some of the really important sort of venues and people that you've worked with as you sort of worked your way up the, the ranking? Yeah, um, one influential or few. There's a few influential chefs that I've had um, and worked with and worked under. Um, Bernie, she's still at Catalina. She'd be one of them. Um, she's the pastry chef. She's been there from the very beginning, day one. She's like a, you know, a a life mentor and coach of mine. She, she showed me so much on, on the whole pastry side of things. And then when I left Catalina, you know, I moved on and I, I went to a venue up in the Northern Beaches, Jonah's at Well Beach. And I worked with, a, he was also a, another Catalina, <laughs> Alamini. He worked there long before I did. I was Logan Campbell. So, yeah, so I worked with Logan for a couple of years and, you know, he's a, you know, he's one of those real old school chefs. He really knows his craft. Um, you know, he knows all the different ingredients. Um, very good with butchery as well. And just his cooking technique and style was, you know, he had his own his own way of doing things. Um, yeah. You, sp- you spent a little bit of time uh, in Melbourne as well with uh, Vue de Monde. And uh, tell us about that period of, of your life sort of going, getting away from Sydney. What, what was that like? Yeah, that was one of the best things I ever did, to be honest. I um, I did a bit of traveling before I left to Melbourne and um, I always wanted to break free from Sydney and go and, you know, continue cooking somewhere else and overseas obviously it was a bit, what would be the word, probably a bit frightening to just go completely off to another country. And um, one weekend I went to Melbourne and I, I met some friends there and I loved it. I clicked with the city straight away. I came back to Sydney two days later and then I moved to Melbourne. Literally, literally a week and a half after that, I said, I've had enough. And, you know, I had nothing here. My, I was uh, in a shared apartment here in Sydney. I packed all my stuff. I went to Melbourne. I think I was in debt <laughs> when I was in Melbourne. I didn't have any money on me. I got a train with three suitcases down uh, from, from Central. And uh, my mum was so worried, I, I still remember. She, she, she came and flew down a couple of days later to make sure it was all right. And um, I was living with a dad's friend at the time. And I got a job at Voudemont, which was, yeah, it was a big deal for me. It was, uh, in my eyes, I was like, oh, wow, you know, I'm working at a, a three-hat restaurant, you know. I've made it to, you know, the top accolade where you can get and working with some of the best chefs in Australia. But um, very different when yeah, you're actually there. It was tough. <laughs> You know, I've got to be careful what I say now. <laughs> but yeah, you probably I didn't didn't make too many friends there, but but I did learn so much. Um, it was a very um, military run sort of style um, background, like procedures to the starting times when you clean the floor, to how things are prepared, um, the cleanliness. It was a very I'm not sure if you've been there. It's it's all completely open on um, level 55 of the Rialto building. So people paying, you know, three to $500 for a meal per, per person. So everything was a big, big show, cooking um, on open hibachis. Um, and that was a massive team as well, about 20, 20 chefs, I think, in there some days on a weekend to do a service of 100 people. 
you know, this, yeah, it was a, a new level for me. Um, and um, up until then in my career, obviously, I learned so much and I was very confident. And when I got into a kitchen of that, it was a whole sort of new level. I felt a bit um, out of place there and I struggled there for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I did almost nine months and then I threw in the towel. Um, but, you know, even in that nine months, I saw so many people come and go. It was a it was a tough place to work. It really was a tough place to work. But um, but I'm grateful I worked there as well because I got to see and have that exposure at a at a level like that in Australia, um, which a lot of people don't get. You've had a few roles now as head chef at different venues. Tell us about your first role there in Melbourne as head chef. My first role as head chef was at uh, Mr. And Mrs. P. Um, it's a small sort of cocktail cocktail bar in Brighton, just um passing Kilda. And it was a thriving cocktail bar, really cool little kitchen, tiny team. It was only me and three others in the kitchen at once. Um, but we was more sort of like we had a bit of Asian Asian influence there on the food, but all sort of small tapas style sort of plates. So everything was very fast paced, in and out. There was no entree mains or this. People would just order as as they went, and it was a great it was a great place. Um, they were great people to work with. Um, very good friends of Greg and George are there, the owners um, of Mr. and Mrs. P. And I think they've opened another cafe recently in Melbourne called Lit- Little P's, from, I believe it was called. I can't, can't remember. Um, yeah, I, I left I left Mr. and Mrs. P when COVID started. Um, so that was, what, March 2020. And, um, you know, that was a bit of a... It's a rough, rough patch in the, for, for not just for me, for everybody, you know, so it was, uh, I got shooken up pretty hard then. I got made redundant and we, we had plans to go to Japan in April. Um, uh, me and my partner, she's, she's Japanese and yeah, we had to cancel everything and I was pushed in, I was working in a call center, <laughs> so working in a call center, yeah, and then finding jobs in, you know, random coffee shops around um, Melbourne, just making sandwiches and doing takeaway food. Um, had a bit of work working with uh, a ballerina with Matt McConnell, who's another yeah, chef. So, yeah, doing whatever I could do really in Melbourne to survive at that point. What's, what sort of impact did that have on you, sort of being forced out of your industry and doing things that you weren't necessarily wanting to do? Was it, was it difficult for you? Yeah, definitely. It was a uh, it was a big shock. Obviously, um, you know, you want to, you know, you got been a very independent person. You know, the better half of my life, and so just to to be able to lose all my income and you know, and um, everything I know how to make money and how, how to look after myself was to go to work and do all that and not have that anymore and be pushed into a into an office to answer phones and battle for a little bit of, you know, a couple of hours here, a couple of hours there, because everyone was doing the same thing on you. And um, it, was, it was very hard to find work. And then obviously the, the government were helping us. So we, we got, got through all that all right. But um, look, I picked up some other skills during that time. We did, I did a, a Cert 4 in cybersecurity because <laughs> I, yeah, I had so much time on my hands. So I got a few IT skills out of, out of the lockdown that I never had before. So I'm pretty pretty switched on with with computers now which has helped a lot with you know running excel sheets and websites and all the other back-end stuff if i ever go and off to do my own business or you know work in, in an office again i've i've got some new skills i guess from it you spent the you spent a couple of years um prior to ripples with the restaurant pendolino hospitality group in sydney tell us about that move back to sydney and how you got that gig yeah so um George Kohler, who I worked with, he was the senior. He was the senior sewer at um, Jonah's when I worked at Jonah's all those years ago. He was the head chef, the current head chef at Pendolino. And um, I've, I've been speaking to George. We're good mates all through the lockdown and everything. And, you know, Melbourne was in nearly two years of, you know, prison, <laughs> you know. And uh, George George just said, you know, they, they were still thriving down there in Sydney and things were open and, you know, if he was looking for a, for a co-head chef um, and uh, he invited me to come down and speak to Nina Sakali, the owner and executive chef of Pendolino. So I came down and, 
yeah, it was a it was a good opportunity for me to to break free from all all of Melbourne, which I do miss Melbourne a lot, to be honest. But um, yeah, that's that's how the the move came about. It was um, it was because yeah, I had a good friend that worked at the restaurant. And he put a reference up for me. Thought I'd be good for the role, and and it was wonderful working at Pendolino. Um, you know, co head chef there to work with Nino Zakali. He he's um. Not just a fantastic chef. He's a he's an amazing operator. He's been a, a businessman for a long time. He really uh, honed my skills in on management and how to run a, a profitable restaurant, not just a, an amazing one. So yeah, I, I learned a lot from from Nino and George, and it was great working there for the past two years. Um, and yeah. Nino's been on the show before and um, he's always got a lot to say and a very influential character in the industry. Do you have any stories of what it's like working with him? Yeah, Nino's a very um, intelligent and passionate person about hospitality. He has a lot of knowledge about obviously Italian Italian cuisine. He comes from an Italian family. Um, he's super passionate about working with, with olive oils. Um, I, learned, I learned a great deal about Working with olive oils, Pendolino is it's a it's a type of olive tree. So there was eighteen different olives olive oils on the menu at one time. So it was great to to have all that um, first hand knowledge from from Nino, and he knew all the the growers and the suppliers, and he would set up meetings. It was it was very um it was very educational on it. You know what I mean? Every 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 ingredient he put on the menu, he would study it and find out where it's from and teach everybody about it. He was, um, it was a good, he was a good mentor for, for, for everyone in that business from kitchen hands all the way through to the chefs and sommeliers. Why did you end up leaving, uh, Pendolino and moving to Ripples? I left, um, Pendolino. Um, look, main, my main thing was obviously to try and put my own stamp on something, build my own, um, yeah, find my own path. Obviously, George and Nino, that that was still, you know, wonderful working with both of them. Um, but I felt like I have, um, I, w- I wanted my own time to, to create, you know, and, and have that creative freedom, um, which is what I've what I've left Pendolino for and, and sought out. And I found it now with um, Chowder Bay, and I do have that. The, the next challenge is building my team so I can really cr- do the food that I'd like to do. Um, mm. How do you feel at the moment? Are you still p- putting the pieces together in regards to that or are you feeling you're starting to get your mojo on, on the menu? Yeah, look, I came in guns blazing and I, I made a lot of changes there and I think I've lost a few people from um, from that process. Um, it's a very difficult place, Chowder Bay, to, to hire. Obviously, location-wise in Sydney, it's not, not very accessible by public transport. So, you know, to find chefs that have cars and want to come to work, that's one side of it. And the next side of it is, you know, doing my own food and my own, you know, philosophy of how to build a menu. It's not, not actually working out how I, how I dreamed it to be, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, is a, is a, there's a little bit of a, a longer road to go there. I mean, the food's great. Um, and, and it's good. We're getting great feedback, but I, I do want to take um, Ripples to a to a new level. But in order to do that, it's it's about building a team at the moment. And you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And like it was going touching on what I was talking about before, a lot of the chefs they don't um they don't learn a lot of these skills anymore. You know, they we get a, we don't get many Australian people going through TAFE and. Working at you know one two hat restaurants, we get a you know it's a high influx of international people, you know entering hospitality for visas. I find and yeah, so the the skill the skill shortage is definitely real. Um, it's uh, there's a big big gap in in the in the skill level and the quality of the skills as well. And I'm finding so I'm having to adjust the menu based around the people not around what what I want or what I believe the customers want. It's about what, what the team can handle at the moment. How are you now at the moment as a head chef compared to the first time uh, you became a head chef? And um, Are you a different person and do you approach things differently to then? Um, I'm always going to be the same person. 
yeah, I can. Um, but look, they're very two two very different businesses. Like Ripples is a very high volume sort of restaurant where where Mr. And Mrs. P was a small cocktail bar. Different different volumes, different sort of stress levels. Um, definitely, from every role I've taken, I've walked away with a new um, outlook on on this career. And 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 you know every every role I've had has been a, a great learning curve. So you know, and then Rip, Ripples is part of a you know a bigger restaurant group. It's also you know the, I think Sydney Restaurant Group is about fourteen now in in the group. So it's a it's a different way of working. And um, but it's but it's also great because I have a you know an executive chef to bounce things off. Um, Adam Spencer, he's been great um, since I started, and we have. You know, fourteen other head chefs. We have a group chat, and you know we can share chefs when we're short, or talk about you know which suppliers getting better ingredients or cheaper ingredients. Um, you know, sharing recipes. So it's becoming uh, a lot more, a lot more transparent and helpful. Where you have what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, collabor- collaborative work. It's become a lot more collaborative working in a group like this having multiple people to talk about our ideas and, and what we do. And well, um, we're heading towards spring and things are going to warm up and people heading out to venues, especially like uh, Ripple's Chowder Bay. Um, what are you looking forward to as the year sort of opens up? Look, I'm looking forward to Ripple's Chowder Bay. We're doing a fit out. We're doing a new fit out. We're going to have a brand new um, uh, floor, all new furniture. It's going to be amazing. It's already an amazing restaurant and it's going to just – take it to a new level in terms of aesthetically what the venue will, will look like inside, not just sitting outside on the deck on the water. Um, we have Ben Manzano who comes from Pilu and Sokio. He's the, the new restaurant manager and he's taking the floor and the service side of things on a new direction. So it's really exciting to be working with someone like Ben. Um, and of course, yeah, like, like I said, like we're in a bit of a transition now trying to find new stuff and I'm really excited and I know know with time we will find some you know new new chefs that are just really passionate and driven um you know we can teach the skills to anyone and I just really need to find some core core people with with passion which I know they're out there and and excited the the summer should be a good one I think with with the new direction from myself Ben and what what that site has to bring um it's an amazing it's a beautiful spot you can't you can't beat it well i think a lot of people would love to spend their days in that part of sydney it's um you'd be mad to not work there as a chef i'd imagine it's uh calvin it's been great to catch up with you today on deep in the weeds and look forward to seeing what you bring there um over in charter bay well, please keep in touch and uh we'll catch up again soon yeah definitely thanks huck thanks for for catching up today This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au and be well.